My name is Dr. Tina Fields, and it's my honor and delight to be your MC today. I serve as full professor of the Low Residency Eco-Psychology Master's Program. Uh, you could scribble off that associate there. I got a ray, uh, promotion. <laughs> Take out your pens, please. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Giovannina asked me to mention that along with mindfulness meditation practice, I also practice the spiritual tradition of Druidry. That's an earth-based, reconstructed Celtic practice. I'm just back from 10 days, yesterday, from 10 days at Shambhala Mountain Center with our incoming cohort of students. I know it's supposed to be cohort, but I don't like those Roman words much, and so one of the students uh, misspoke and said cohort, and I said, no, that's it. It's a cohort. <laughs> and later in the ceremony, I have a number of students here today, and we'll be offering something for you together. So, at this moment in Naropa tradition, I invite you all to bring your attention to your heart, recognizing your innate goodness and the innate goodness of everyone around you, seen and unseen, and then we will bow, coming up, ready to face whatever is. Thank you. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to this convocation, celebrating the beginning of a new academic year. As birthdays mark our life, and spring marks the new earth year, so fall is this traditional marking of a new academic year full of possibilities, right? And it's nice to mark these beginnings ceremonially. I'm really glad you're here. Welcome students, staff, faculty, board of trustees members, friends, family, and general Naropa groupies. <laughs> Did I miss anybody? <laughs> Many wise people have spoken of the importance of starting any new thing with gratitude. From our own great teacher, Joanna Macy, to the Christian mystic Meister Eckhart, who said around the year 1300, Wer das Wort danke, das einzige Gebet, das du je sprichst, so wurde es genügen. If the only prayer you ever say is thank you, that will be enough. And like Naropa begins all gatherings with a centering bow, a lot of people, the, Ho we, the Haudenosaunee Tribal Confederacy, start with the words that come before all else. I think we have much to learn from indigenous peoples. Uh, they actually went to the UN and suggested that they begin to use this practice. And so I'd like to bring it here. I mean, think about our bow. I love our bow. I love it. I mean, when you think about it, all meetings, all classes, you're going into this meeting and you know darn well it's going to be fraught. That that person over there is going to be a big pain in the neck, as usual, and they're going to be against whatever you're trying to push forward, and you're just like, oh my god, it's going to take forever. But to start with the moment of remembering their innate goodness, it changes things. It's beautiful. And so this one, the Haudenosaunee Tribal Confederacy of Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora, also known as the Iroquois League, but that's a French word, so not what they use. They brought this practice to the UN knowing it might help with tense negotiations if everyone involved first remembers not only basic goodness but the basic gifts we all share and on whom our lives depend and so therefore to whom we must tend. So facing hard times, I thought it might be a good idea to start our year off this way. When I name each being and I say greetings and thanks, then you are invited to also say greetings and thanks back. Okay. I'll begin by saying to all of you gathered here today, thank you deeply for coming and for being such an integral part of co-creating whatever is to emerge. To each other as people, greetings and thanks. Greetings, greetings and thanks. I also offer gratitude to those who support us and made this moment possible. The lineage of Naropa, the, our founder, Chugyam Trungpa, his teachers, back to Tilopa and the hag story. If you don't know the hag story yet, this is your first homework. It rocks. <laughs> and our ancestors, all of our ancestors, both physical and spiritual, 
to our parents, our teachers, our inspirations, to all of these teachers, past and present, who show us how to live in a good way, greetings and thanks. To the southern Arapaho people on whose ancestral lands Naropa now lives, may the work of restitution continue apace. To the southern Arapaho people, greetings and thanks. <laughs> Welcome and thanks also to the future beings, children now and those not yet born, whose hands our students will someday hold as we are holding those who come before. And so the lineage goes on. To the future beings, <laughs> greetings and thanks. And in thinking of the circumstances that have brought us all to this place at this time, let's also include a moment of gratitude to our larger community beyond the human, the earth we stand in, mother of all who gives us a home and all of our nourishment, to the earth, greetings and thanks. To the water, the beginning of our lives in the womb, the basis of our survival, Oceans, rivers, waterfalls, rain, delicious mud puddles. We can live without water only three days. That's it. To the water, greetings and thanks. Greetings and thanks. To the air, breath of life in our lungs, what allows you to hear my words right now. Our earth is a closed system, you know, and air illustrates our interconnectedness so clearly. Take one breath. It's the out-breath of countless trees you're taking in. And your out-breath is their in-breath. We're breathing together. With every breath, you are conspiring with trees. <laughs> Take another breath, I invite you. This is the same air that was once in the lungs of the dinosaurs, of Cleopatra, of a prisoner on death row, of Jesus and the Buddha. To the air, greetings and, thanks. greetings and thanks. To the fire, fire in our bellies, the life force. Fire in our hearts for justice. Fire in our minds for knowledge. Fire in our souls for inspiration. I would love to tell you the story that uh, an anthropologist who worked with the Cheyenne once told me about how he, they all believed that the fire was our first teacher. The fire created our abstract thinking and then our language and therefore who we are today. But, uh, you know, I probably don't have time, and, and you'd say, you know, but I digress, so I will not do it this time, but come ask me. To the fire, <laughs> greetings and thanks. And then to the other than human brothers and sisters with whom we share our home, other animal peoples besides humans, greetings and thanks. Greetings. To the plant peoples, trees, herbs, food plants, greetings and thanks. Greetings. To the bug peoples, doesn't matter how hard you hit, it's greetings and thanks. <laughs> to the bird peoples, those who fly, sing, give us joy, greetings and thanks. To the swimming peoples in the fresh and salt waters, greetings and thanks. To the celestial beings by whose movements we can count the days of our lives, moon, the sun, the stars, the clouds, greetings and thanks. And so many more. To anyone we've not spoken of, but also not forgotten, we honor our rich and wise elders of all species. Greetings and thanks. Greetings. Welcome and thanks to all. Now our minds are one. As we find ourselves here at this moment of great change and upheaval on so many levels in our country, the planet, and our personal lives, it can help to remember that we are part of this beautiful living system of kin, and we stand with our hands in those of so many giants, supporting us to, as the Naropa Mission exhorts, meet the world as it is and change it for the better. It's my pleasure now to invite three dignitaries to speak. Following Naropa's noble tradition of poetry, I've decided to introduce them in a short traditional verse. <laughs> and for this occasion, I've chosen a modest and slightly inappropriate form, <laughs> the limerick. <laughs> 
First, I'd like to welcome Charles Leaf, president of Naropa University. <clears throat> to be presidential like Charles Leaf means to hold paradox beyond belief. Both a wild Trungpa student and financially prudent, to be just Chuck must be a relief. <laughs> President Leaf. <laughs> So this is truly messed up. Normally, the MC bow, maybe a gong, a little thank you, a little business done. They don't do this, right? So, I didn't know that. It's, it's fine, but let's see. So I'm going to just make some changes here. This was, thank you. This was really great. And uh, I just personally, it's a delight to have Tina back with us after sabbatical. Thank you for being here. We miss the energy and glad you're back. Um, I just want to welcome all the same people that Tina did, and I have a fair amount to say, so I'm not going to name them all, so welcome. Um, I also want to acknowledge that for the last 44 years, every year a committee of people have come together to step up and plan this important event, this convocation. So again, without naming everybody, many thanks to all of you. Your efforts have created a really wonderful way for us to spend some time together. Uh, and we're all really grateful for your work, so thank you for that. Um, in this world, I think we're often overwhelmed by the multiple inputs, uh, invitations, magnetic pulls of all kinds, trying to get our time and attention. And that can be exhausting. I'm sure everybody feels that. One way to deal with the speed, I think, is through ritual. And Tina started talking about that uh, a minute ago but a ritual, some kind of a way to connect, to share our minds and our hearts, open up to what arises, whether it's planned or spontaneous, and we'll do some of each, I hope, uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, this ritual, the convocation, creates a container for the community to join together, uh, inviting us to share our hearts and our minds with each other and to tap into the lineage of convocation goers who for 44 years have generously brought their full selves, their thoughts, their feelings, their emotions, their confusions, their wisdoms to this space or a space just like it somewhere else. They probably, when they were here, maybe as mo most of us, didn't really focus on the lasting impact of spending a couple of hours together on a Wednesday afternoon. But I'm certain that we actually are all leaving our contemplative DNA in this space. I'm pretty sure that the previous attendees are haunting Naropa. I think you'll find they'll turn up in unexpected places and probably at the most inconvenient times. They'll inspire, they'll motivate, they'll cry, they'll laugh, do all those things. I finally figured out that giving in to the experience of meeting the ghosts of Naropa, which also meant setting aside what I normally think is a generally rational mind, is the way to go. <laughs> you'll address the ghosts in whatever ways you do, but letting go of rationality might be one way to do it. And in an odd way, that's actually the point of contemplative practice, I think. Trungpa Rinpoche said that practice isn't purely sitting alone in a particular posture attending to simple processes, but is also an, is an openness to the environment in which those processes take place, where the environment becomes a reminder to us, continually giving us messages, teachings, and insights. So, I think that's the point of why we gather together, why we created a university. Um, the consistently giving us messages part, I get really well. And uh, they're not always welcome, but they're always there. Uh, I hope you will or have uh, experienced the environment as Naropa in the multi-dimensional way that it exists. And I invite you to drop your own rationality at some point and tap into the energy that's been transmitted here from the beginning. This is the seventh time that I've been able to offer some convocation remarks as president. Uh, because of the date, the time that we're doing this convocation, I also always note that we're gathering just around the anniversary of the earth-shattering March on Washington led by Dr. Martin Luther King in 1963. And for the seventh time, I want to draw our attention away from the very moving and so well-known I have a dream portion of the speech to the essential instruction on action that Dr. King offered. He said, we have come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now, 
There is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. To me, those 37 words are a profound description of what our faculty have committed to since the first class was offered a mere 11 years after that speech was given to hundreds of thousands of people in Washington. I can say, because I was here, that not one of the founding faculty who gathered in Boulder when we started this endeavor arrived carrying a backpack of gradualism. Uh, indeed, the promise of Naropa was, and I think still is, uh, that from a contemplative ground, both students and teachers could arise as impactful activists, change makers, and compassionate actors in the world. And every year later in the spring, as I greet graduates who walk across the stage with their diplomas, or their fake diplomas, this is the way it works, uh, I'm o <laughs> they get them eventually. Um, I'm overjoyed with the power and the wisdom and the readiness that each of those graduates exude. When I and others began studying with Naropa's founder, the appeal to me was a clear invitation not to leave the world behind, but to bring our activist inspiration to the practice. I realized also yesterday or the day before that this week is also the 50th anniversary of the infamous Democratic Convention and police riot in Chicago. Does that mean anything to anyone? It's pretty good, okay. Um, for me, being on the streets of Chicago, being tear gassed and roughed up by the police for daring to bear witness to a racist war in Vietnam created the conditions that allowed me to meet my teacher. I was 17 years old with a teenage version of fierceness and an absolutely no, absolutely no room for gradualism myself. What was missing, however, was a disciplined ground of contemplative practice or mindfulness in today's let's not be too spiritual world that could shine a bright light on the missing pieces, that offered the tools uh, to be with and to act with wisdom, compassion, and skillful action. So that's my story, but each of us, I think, here has a motivation story. What were the conditions in your life that actually caused you to be sitting here today? That would be an amazing thing to do. We could spend a year kind of doing that, like a great book seminar or something like that, and it would be a remarkable learning journey, I think. What was it that... Um, uh, match my good fortune of being introduced to a genuine practice path by skilled teachers and which supports and focuses the passion for social and economic justice and engagement in an inclusive world. Each of us, I think, could look at that and see where we came from, and I think that would be good work to do. I also recognize that it's easy to be pretty cynical. What's happened in the last half century? The environment is degrading at a faster rate. Economic disparity between rich and poor is stark. We've managed to enter into more wars. Abusive power runs rampant, showing up in ethnic, racial, gender, and religious bias and injustice. Sort of a mess over the last 50 years. But at the first summer of Naropa Institute, our founder said that this was a 500-year project. That required those of us who were around to develop a measure of patience that was very unfamiliar. And moreover, to figure out <clears throat> how that kind of patience was not the same as laziness and is not antithetical to Dr. King's warning about cooling off or taking a tranquilizing <clears throat> drug. Excuse me. Holding those two perspectives is the hard but essential work that we try and engage in here. We're educating and collaborating with students who themselves and for generations to follow them are going to lead, going to transform the world, as we say. You may be invited to lead or you may take the lead. Either way, I hope you'll feel both the urgency and the long view. So do I want everybody in this room to, that can to vote in November? For sure. But I also know that planting a seed today will not blossom, uh, that will not blossom until long after I'm gone is of equal importance to a world that is suffering. Not being able to witness change, which will happen, is no excuse for not working hard to affect that change and to create the conditions that will allow that change. And that's our commitment to each student at Naropa. Changing topics a bit. I wrote that because it actually I couldn't figure out the transition, so there you go. <laughs> Just hold on to all that and now we'll go somewhere else. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Some members of our community, I want to acknowledge, have struggled this summer with the revelation of the misuse of power and highly inappropriate and damaging behavior by the Naropa lineage holder, Sakyang Mipam Rinpoche, and others in the leadership positions within the Shambhala organization. 
The board and I could not take the easy way out and say that since Naropa has been legally separated and independent from Shambhala for more than 30 years, and since the Sakyong's role at Naropa was more ceremonial than not, uh, that we didn't need to deal with the problem as if it was our own. The fact is we share teachers, we share staff, and we share students with Shambhala. And of course, we share a founder who himself was a very complex, sometimes controversial figure in his own time. So the pain and the confusion that our colleagues are working with is ours to work with as a community as well. The fact is we are connected to our founder, Trungpa Rinpoche's lineage in the same way that we can't argue we're, we don't have a genetic connection to our mother or father. That's just a fact. The Sakyong is part of that lineage, and so addressing the issues that are the issues of struggle are our issues to address as well. Naropa made the decision to ask the Sakyong to resign from his roles at Naropa, which he did. That action in no way can be seen as one that will fix what's broken, but I hope it affirms Naropa's values and contributes to a community dialogue for those who desire that process. It's very important to have a conversation about what lineage actually means, how we can honor the founding energy of Naropa without feeling pressured to not ask questions or to not look at the whole picture. We're putting considerable effort this semester into creating spaces uh, for dialogue, including uh, really dedicating the practice day on October 16th to look more deeply into these issues. And of course, that's not the only way that people can engage, and I invite you to do so as it feels honest and feels right. A lot of change is also afoot at Naropa. I've never used the word afoot, ever. So I, I, I couldn't, it was great that it came out, afoot. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I just realized that. Um, it's always the case that there's change in a living institution like this, but what we're facing right now is that a new paradigm is emerging. Sue here? Yay. That's Sue West's word, I love it. A new paradigm is emerging as we recreate a 21st century university. And as many of you know, we've launched some new programs. Some of you are participating in them now. Notable is the BA in elementary education the very first in the nation path toward teacher licensure in which teachers are learning traditional classroom curriculum together with contemplative pedagogy, and one that integrates mindfulness and compassion into the curriculum. Many of today's teachers across the country feel burnout and are pressed to find ways to care for themselves and their students. If they're lucky, their schools might support them to receive training in some kind of mindfulness or contemplative approaches to teaching, and that's a good thing. But what we're doing is changing that right now. We don't want teachers that come to us because they're burned out. We want teachers who enter the classroom from day one feeling nourished and stay nourished through their whole career. And so I want to welcome the uh, pioneering first class for this BA program. Uh, as some of you know, we also acquired the wonderful alternative first year program called Leap Year. Leap year used to be called a gap program, but it's a full credit first year experience in university. Leap year staff are now Naropa colleagues, and leap year students will, before going abroad for their experiential learning, come to Colorado for their retreats. Some will be in Boulder, some will be at, at Chambala Mountain Center. But they are very much Naropa students who are using a different doorway to enter here. and We're really excited for that opportunity. Uh, I want to thank our colleague Cheryl Barber for managing the complexity of integrating Leap Year into Naropa. Leap Year was founded by two people with long connections to Naropa, which meant they left here really complicated. And therefore, <laughs> and we're really complicated, and therefore our negotiation was super complicated. And somehow Cheryl, who's simpler than most in many ways, in a great way, managed to navigate it. So I want to thank you for that. Um, all, <laughs> sure. I also want to say that after a somewhat rocky start, we are now getting ready to accept a new class into our low residency master's degree program in mindfulness-based transpersonal psychology, therefore bringing one of our legacy programs to non-traditional learners and offering the world an increasing number of excellent counselors and therapists, something we're really excited about. Faculty have worked very hard to put this program together and, and I think it's, a, it's the first of many the first of several programs that we plan to bring to this non-traditional platform to expand what it means to become part of the Naropa community. And that's not simple because I think gathering together in community is such a part of the heart and soul of this place that how we allow that 
um, experience to be felt by students in a primarily online platform is the trick. A lot of faculty here have done that work and have done it successfully, so I'm confident it will work, but it's a responsibility, actually, to make sure that people get the full Naropa when they come in through that gate. There have been many changes to the Academic Affairs Division led by Provost Janet Kramer, uh, which have been shared with staff and faculty, will be shared with students now that we're in session and you're here. The reasons for the changes to create efficiency, find better ways to support our students and our mission, to save money where we can, they're all very sound. But there's also a real impact on several Naropa staff members, some who are newer to Naropa and many who have been here for a long time employees whose positions have been eliminated as part of this change. Many of those employees, we hope, will fill the new jobs that are opening. We're not actually re uh, reducing very many jobs, and there are new ones, and we hope they will be filled by our current colleagues. But some are going to retire, and some are not going to find satisfying ways to remain at Naropa. That creates real pain in the community, and it can't be glossed over, and it needs to be acknowledged. Um, it was a tough uh, it was a tough summer figuring out how to minimize that human pain and at the same time acknowledge that we needed to size this university to serve the students that we have and to do it efficiently so that we can actually keep the doors open for the next 460 years that we need to to get through our 500 year experiment. I want to express thanks to Tyler Kelsch as well as our Vice President for Operations for his work in both envisioning and implementing these needed changes. Uh, all this work involved many, many staff and faculty, and so gratitude is owed to all who did so much work. And I know that a lot of questions are coming up and concerns, which happens around times of change. I don't want to lose also expressions of gratitude for people that spent the last many months, uh, many hours outside whatever narrow boundary of their contract said, <clears throat> doing this work, collaborating, looking at what's in the best interests of Naropa in terms of sustainability, and most importantly, what will serve the students best. And so I continue to be grateful for that. Students will see that following the departure uh, in the summer of our former Dean of Students, Leary Nurse, that we've distributed the work of the Dean of Students office across several departments. Most notable is that the wide array of student support services that will now be, will now be offered in the Office for Inclusive Community led by the newly promoted Regina Smith, who is now our Executive Director for Mission Integration and Student Affairs. I'm personally grateful for Regina for expanding the tent and for her continued care for our students and for collaborating with Michael Bauer, our drummer and also director of sustainability, to ensure that sustainability indeed is integrated into our mission. It is now also a home for Jovanina and the director of contemplative practices. So inclusive community is truly evolving as a real community uh, um, place to be. We continue to invest in diversity in many forms as well. Again this year, we dedicated almost half of our collected tuition so that it's returned to students in the form of student financial aid, in large part in order for Naropa to be a real option with, for students with fewer means. I can't overstate the challenge of that decision to a university of our size with a modest endowment, um, limited income, but a burning commitment to uh, open our doors to the most diverse population of students that we possibly can. I also want to acknowledge and I want students particularly to understand that our staff and faculty are directly investing in accomplishing that goal. And they're doing that in part through lower than desirable compensation and through having low, le fewer resources than we would like to provide. That's real and it's important and it needs to be acknowledged. I appreciate the commitment every day, commitment for our of our staff and faculty. And with the support of a really strong team now led by Angela Madura, Director of Development, my goal is to continue to find people with the means and the passion to support our mission and to expand their generosity. The BA in Education is a perfect example where somebody stepped forward, wrote us a check for $800,000 to launch that program. She is not the only such person in the world, and my job is to make sure I find more of them. <laughs> By doing that, we can balance the essential work of creating a well-resourced and diverse university, 
along with support for faculty and staff that matches their dedication and care for the students. I also need to say that the student voice is a crucial one for us to hear as Naropa grows and changes. As I always do, I invite students to engage with the student union of Naropa and to become involved with student government. I appreciate the student perspective in whatever form it comes, but I will say that those perspectives are most effective when they're heard through your elected body because they can be put together, synthesized, and we can actually get something done. So I want to close by just thanking all of you for being here. It's a privilege for all of us to serve the students, and I believe that the students understand, I hope you understand, that relative to billions of people around the world, it's a privilege for you to have a chance to study, to recharge, to activate, and to celebrate at Naropa, inside the classroom and throughout the community, whether in planned or unplanned ways. That's the invitation, uh, that's the invitation that we all offer for uh, this semester and for the rest of your time at Naropa, and I hope you have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, President Leaf. Just to clarify, Jovanina gave me two roles, MC and invoker. <laughs> um, before we continue, I'd like to request that you silence your cell phones if you haven't already. Thanks. And I'd now like to welcome Dr. Janet Kramer, the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs. Coming up with her are also Kelly Watt, the Senior Director of Marketing and, Ad and Admissions, and her husband, Phil Rosenberg Watt. And I'm sorry, Kelly and Phil, I didn't know you were coming, so I only have a poem for Janet. <laughs> to be provost like our Janet Kramer takes the skills of a fierce lion tamer, <laughs> wrestling all that might bind an inquiring mind while not letting the calendar claim her. <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to the year. Welcome to this year. I have more I want to say about this particular moment in time and the character of this welcome, and Kelly and Phil are here to be a part of that. And I want to thank you, Chuck, for your remarks and your acknowledgment of um, uh, all that the community lives through and experiences. Uh, but first, as is customary, I want to introduce the new core faculty and instructors who joined us this fall. We have other new core faculty coming in January, and I will be sending out an announcement closer to that time with that information. But for now, for the new ranked faculty, uh, please stand to be recognized when I say your name. Marina Dorian, core candidate associate professor, mindfulness-based transpersonal counseling. Marina's not here. I'll introduce her anyway. <laughs> Marina holds a PhD in clinical and community psychology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has most recently held a faculty position at the California School of Professional Psychology at Alliant International University in San Diego. She has conducted international research on family stress and resilience and has published and presented on the importance of incorporating mindfulness into clinical training and the role of mindfulness in decreasing implicit bias in counseling. Siri Gunnarsson, Instructor and Gap Year Curriculum Director, Leap Year Program. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Siri has worked with Leap Now in a variety of capacities over the past 12 years, beginning as a group leader in India. She has coordinated and participated in projects around the world, including building peace huts in Kenya, living in eco-villages, and participating in Walking Water, a pilgrimage for reconciliation of relationship. She also practices permaculture and is a guide with the School of Lost Borders, focusing on the young adult wilderness rite of passage and the nature of counsel. Elizabeth Betsy Leach, instructor in contemplative education. <laughs> 
Hey. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Betsy. <laughs> Betsy taught in K through 12 public schools for 10 years, teaching Spanish for heritage speakers and Spanish as a world language, earning a Language Teacher of the Year Award in 2017. She has founded a Latina Student Union, a Spanish-speaking parent coalition, a SEAL of Biliteracy program, and a Heritage Spanish program. She is an education consultant around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and will be teaching courses in the cultural and linguistic diversity endorsement of our new teacher licensure program. Welcome, Betsy. <laughs> Jessica Weitzel. <laughs> Cor Cor <laughs> yeah. Jessica's core candidate assistant professor in contemplative art therapy. Jessica has been part of our graduate art therapy faculty since 2007, and we're delighted that she will now be serving our undergraduate students in the second year of the art therapy program there. She is a licensed professional counselor and a board certified art therapist. In addition to teaching, she maintains a private practice working with children and adolescents and has co-authored a treatment manual to help clinicians utilize somatosensory approaches in working with traumatized children. And now, if there are any new adjunct faculty here today, could you stand so we can recognize you at this time? Great. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so this year, for many of us, in many ways, we are in a time of change, as uh, Chuck described in his address. It could be the personal change that our new student, staff, and faculty have made to come here. And it is definitely about changes in the university. For some of you, this is your first convocation. For some of you, it may be your last. Um, as Tina Field said, many of us here are students of Joanna Macy, the author, scholar of systems theory, longtime Buddhist practitioner, and friend to Naropa. And in times of change, Joanna offers her work that reconnects which leads through a spiral, a process that begins with gratitude, thank you, moves to grief, then to seeing with new eyes, and finally to going forth. And this isn't a linear process. That's why it's a spiral. We return and we come back. And Joanna calls this a great turning that is about personal and social transformation. Anybody come here for that? <laughs> to my mind, though, most importantly, Joanna Macy says, this is an incredible time to be alive, a great privilege. In other words, you are here at this time, in this place, with these people, experiencing all that is for a reason. And there is great mystery and magic in that in what feels like loss, but also a glimpse of a new thing. It may feel like an individual experience, but there is a collective energy that moves us through this spiral, this transformation that happens because we are here together at the same time, at the same place. And this, ultimately, is about hope. I come to sing a song about hope I'm not inspired much right now But even so I came out here to sing a song So here I go I guess I think That if I tinker verse is done, the work's begun. I come to sing a song about hope, in spite of everything ridiculous and sad, though I'm beyond belief, depressed, confused, and mad. Well, I got dressed. I underestimated how much 
wish that would take I didn't break Until right now I sing of hope And don't know how So maybe I can substitute strength Because I'm strong I'm strong Thank you, uh, Provost Kramer. Thank you, Kelly and Phil, for the beautiful song. I'd now like to welcome Jeffrey Petherbridge, who will lead us in the spontaneous poem. Hit <laughs> him. I with apologies to the real poet. <laughs> I now introduce Jeffrey Petherbridge. With his poetry, he often walks on the edge. When some lines ring tragic, his following adjectives light many lamps through the foliage. <laughs> Friends, Romans, brothers, sisters, all our kindred beyond that binary, welcome in the ways that I can. This is the spontaneous poem. So as you may have heard, we have this idea, this intention, this instinct, that some days the best thought is the first thought, and the first thought the best thought. Let's hope that today is one of those days. <laughs> um, I'm an etymology addict, as many of you in this room probably know. And I'd like to remind us all that the etymology of poetry it's the Greek poesis, which is a making. So today we'll begin in spontaneity, making the thing we will make together, together in the coming year. So I'm going to draw names, and then you'll stand, clear your mind, if that's even possible. <laughs> I'm reminded of a really beautiful figure of the mind and soul that comes from the Platonic dialogue, the Theaetetus, when Socrates says, and let us imagine that the soul is a kind of aviary, and in it all sorts of birds flying about, some singly and some in flocks. Audrey LaRue. Vibrancy. Tom Weiser. The room is full of limits, ghosts, and music. The room is full of limericks, ghosts, and music. Randall Mauercourt. Oil on 
There is snake oil on every street corner. We're halfway through. Simply, Caleb. In all things woven and tangled together. Great. And, and all things woven and tangled together. Swanee Astrid, beloved. Yo, you give me that one more time, friend? Yes. Uh, a bit of bibliomancy, which is another form of spontaneity, and a ghost. Enjoyest the worship of spies and endless devotion intoned by mustached radio announcers. <laughs> Which is a kind of conceptual rhyme with those snake oil salesmen. <laughs> And now the ultimate line. Er. In water. In water. In water. Ladies and gentlemen, the judges have deliberated. <laughs> Vibrancy. The room is full of limericks, ghosts, and music. There's a snake oil salesman on every corner. In all things woven and entangled, Together, enjoy us the worship of spies and endless devotions intoned by mustached radio announcers in water. Thank you, Jeffrey and the poets. I'd now like to bring up my present eco-psychology master's students. And if there are any students from previous cohorts who are here, you're welcome to come up too because you know what we're going to do. <laughs> Please come up. Dakota Limon, Mer Meredith Doherty, Patrice Gonzalez, Kat Hazel Pantaleo, faculty member Travis Cox, Tegan Campia, Blaze Diamond and Audrey LaRue. Yeah. We're going to sing a song for you and then invite you to sing that I begin the program with every year, and also we begin all of our intensives, too. It starts with the words, it's in beauty, it's begun. In beauty, it's begun. And the beauty that this is speaking of isn't just, you know, the airbrushed magazine sort of beauty, but a felt rightness, deep beauty, a harmony, alignment, balance, beauty with a big B. 
You know, when you know that sense, oh, it's beautiful, I love you like that. that. And the reason that we sing this song is perceptual psychology research actually strongly suggests that whatever we repeatedly focus on can in large part actually determine our experienced reality. And so when we sing this, you're invited to turn your minds toward the words with us. <laughs> I feel short. <laughs> in beauty it's begun. In beauty it's begun. In beauty it's begun. In beauty it's begun. To the left. Beauty to the left of me. Beauty to the right of me. Beauty before me. Beauty behind me. Beauty below me, beauty above me, beauty all around me, beauty inside of me, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty to the left of me, in beauty to the right of me, in beauty before me. Beauty behind me, beauty below me, beauty above me, beauty all around me, beauty inside of me, in beauty it's begun, 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 in beauty it's begun. In beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty above me, in beauty all around me, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun. We're inviting you now to sing with us. In beauty it's begun, get ready. Here we go, in beauty it's begun. In beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun. To the left, beauty to the left of me, beauty to the right of me, beauty before me, beauty behind me, beauty below me, beauty above me, beauty all around me, beauty inside of me. In beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun, in beauty it's begun. If you enjoyed that kind of singing, uh, I'm leading a singing class that starts tomorrow morning, and there are still openings for both uh, uh, students for credit and auditors. Anybody can audit. So now we come to the close. Thank you so much for being here today, for what you do and who you are. Thanks also to Carol and Brian for the interpreting for the hard of hearing. We'll now close with a gong. Am I ahead of schedule? I'm ahead of schedule. <laughs> you want the fire story? <laughs> yeah? It's really cool. <laughs> OK, here. This is all of our shared story, right? The Ice Ages, our ancestors huddling in caves in the Ice Ages, long, cold, really hard to survive. Okay. And you don't want to go outside much. You're huddling in these caves most of the time. You might go out just enough to get water or just enough to get some food, and you're coming back in where it's, you know, shivering and you're hanging out together. And you're staring at fire because fire is what's keeping you warm and alive. The fire is the center of everything. You know how when you get near a fire, everybody just kind of like, wow, we're all staring at that fire. There is, it's really compelling, right? It's because this is hardwired into us, this fire. It's so old, hardwired to be staring at that fire. We did it so long. So... Imagine then, 
You're staring at the fire for days and months and years on end, a lot. And suddenly you might notice, you know how it is, you're looking at a fire, there's a picture in the fire, right? The flames start to make a picture. Well, it's not really there. You see a bison in the fire, say, it's not really there. You're like, it's a fire. There's no bison in that fire. But you see the bison in the fire. And then you want to turn to somebody and say, hey, you see that bison in that fire? Like, what's going on here? Do you see that? And so the fire has taught us abstract thought. And then the fire has taught us the desire for language. And then we start to develop it. So you see, the fire is our first teacher that gave us abstract thought and language, the bases that we now structure our higher education on. Fire is our first teacher, fire. All hail fire. May the fire continue in all of our hearts, minds, and bellies as we move forward. So thank you again for being here today. What you do, who you are, and bright blessings for a wonderful academic year. Now we'll close with a gong and a bell. <laughs> to declare the academic year of 2018-19 open. And uh, after, immediately after, please join us on the Arapaho Green right out there by those magnificent sycamores for light refreshments. I am so excited to get to read this. <laughs> I can't even tell you.